Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk about a topic that just absolutely fascinates me, and that's our ability to develop new crops. As you can see from the uh, photograph, uh, these are different carrots, and look how much diversity we have in carrot varieties. And just about any food we have has similar amounts of diversity. But that hasn't always existed. As a matter of fact, the, that orange carrot, the one that we're most familiar with, has only been around about 300 years. So this is a picture I actually took on my summer vacation. Um, it's Stirling Castle in Scotland. And um, they have spent 10 million pounds restoring the castle exactly the way it was in the year 1540 when Mary of Guise lived there. Mary of Guise was the mother of, uh, of Mary Stuart, um, or Mary Queen of Scots. She's the one that Queen Elizabeth I had uh, her head cut off. But anyway, in this castle, there's a reproduction of uh, what Mary of Guise would have had for lunch in 1540. And I'm wondering, does any of you see anything that is off, that should not be in that picture? Anyone? So, who said strawberries? Okay, it, it is the strawberry. As a matter of fact, I told that fellow there you know that those strawberries did not exist in 1540, and he answered, well, here in Scotland, we have always had them. <laughs> well, I tell the story then because I think the common perception is that all our crops are things that we've always had, things that people found in nature, when in fact, uh, it is no such thing. The strawberry is one of those things, well, at least the modern strawberry, is one of those things that never did exist in nature. Uh, its origin uh, dates back to Europe in the 1740s. It was when the French were going around the world collecting uh, botanical specimens, and they brought back the uh, Chilean strawberry, it's one species, and the uh, wild strawberry from North America, and uh, they, by accident probably crossed. Uh, we think it happened in the Paris Botanical Garden, and that's where all modern strawberries come from. They're considered a separate species. Probably the most exa uh, famous example of something that uh, never existed in nature is wheat. Wheat's the cross of three different weedy grasses. The first cross uh, happened in probably in prehistoric times and it gave rise to the pasta wheats. In turn, uh, there was a second cross between the pasta wheats and another weed, uh, and that's where all modern bread wheats come from. And this happened in a farmer's field in what we believe is Iraq, uh, maybe five, 6,000 years ago. But again, uh, wheat then is not something you find wild in nature. So, this brings me then to what I call my starting misconception, or the myth of natural food, is that our crops are in their natural state, how they were found in the wild. So many people think that somebody in Italy was walking around, found a big beautiful tomato, planted them in their garden, used it to invent uh, pizzas and, and other uh, tomato sauces. But when in fact, you know, tomatoes aren't even native to Italy. What Whoever found the original tomato found something like this. And it is the process of going from that tiny little fruit to our modern tomato that we in agriculture call genetic modification in its broadest sense. And on top of that, over the past 50 years, the breeders, and that's, that's the, actually the name of the science and the name of the people that uh, make the process, have been crossing these tomatoes with other species of tomatoes and they have brought in a lot of genes 
for flavor. They brought in a lot of genes for uh, disease resistance, agronomic qualities, and whatnot. So therefore, I actually find it pretty ironic that the tomato is still the symbol of everything that's pure and natural, because there is very little that is natural about a tomato. The first person that probably realized uh, that, that we had modified plants was Charles Darwin. And when he wrote The Origin of Species, he actually addressed the issue of crop plants as well. And he said that the plants that we have today are the, from a, a kind of selection when everyone was trying to possess and breed from the best individuals. In other words, you would plant your garden, but the seed you would save came from maybe the plant that gave you the largest fruit or the sweetest fruit or whatnot. And that over time, these changes accumulated until Darwin observed that in a vast number of cases, we can no longer recognize the wild parent stocks of these plants. So to illustrate what Darwin meant by not being able to recognize these, I have a little quiz for you. Here's three pictures of wild parent stalks of very common plants that we have in our garden. And uh, for those of you who have not seen these pictures before, any guess as to what those crops might be? Anybody? What's that? Yeah, corn is one, potato is not. Oh, anyone else? Okay, so uh, uh, genetic modification. Uh, this is another example that just and never ceases to amaze me. Wild cabbage. You know, it's got edible leaves, and uh, as people began selecting for the edible parts, they came up with kale. Uh, some people, particularly those around the Mediterranean, kept selecting for even larger leaves, whereas those in the on the continental Europe, hardy folk uh, selected for stems. So by a couple thousand years ago, we had cabbage and kohlrabi. There was a major mutation in cabbage that gave us cauliflower. Another mutation in cauliflower gave us broccoli. And then the most recent one, I guess sort of contemporary with the carrot that I mentioned earlier, are the Brussels sprouts. And out of curiosity, how many, raise your hand if you would have been perfectly okay if those last mutations had never happened. <laughs> so, anyway, um, Darwin's observation then was that breeders could never have expected or even have wished to have produced their results which ensued. The power of plant breeding to just create, uh, to assemble different, uh, combinations of diversity is still, as I said at the beginning, really fascinating. So today, just like we have varieties for fruits and vegetables, we also have them for grain crops. This is what we would call a variety trial, a wheat. And as you can see from each plot, they're all in different stages of maturity. They're at different stages of uh, height. Uh, they're going to differ by their yield, by their composition, by their bread making qualities and whatnot. So we have a lot of variety to uh, work with. I chose uh, the uh, disease resistance, pest resistance, uh, as to illustrate the example, but I could have easily chosen quality traits. This is a soybean leaf from one of my uh, research plots and one of my students and just to show you a little cross-section of this leaf, he said, have you ever seen uh, over you know, four different pests and diseases on just one square inch? Well, this is typical to what happens to all crops in the field. So from a farmer's point of view, this is not good. It lowers yield, it lowers quality. So they have a couple of options. The farmers pretty much have to control the pests and diseases with chemicals or count on the breeders to deploy genetic resistance. You know, every, pop, every crop has rare individuals that have genetic resistance to diseases. 
So here's an example of two soybean leaves. The one with all the brown spots is susceptible to a disease of soybean. It's a fungus that we call brown-eyed uh, frog-eye leaf spot. And the other leaf is resistant. Where this resistance was found, if you notice in this photograph, in the back you have plants that look like soybean. This would be our commercial variety, but it might lack the resistance to frog eye. And in the front is a wild soybean, and this wild soybean then happened to have a gene for resistance to, um, to this disease. So the breeder's job is to cross the two together and hope to come up with something that looks like the cultivated variety but has the resistance to the disease. And today, if you go and look at any uh, seed catalog, here's an example of a seed catalog. On the one hand, we have the, the names of the different uh, soybean varieties that are for sale. And across the top, uh, you will see the different diseases. And then the little boxes indicate if that variety is resistant or susceptible uh, to that disease. And the goal, then, is to try and put as many resistances as possible into one variety. So this is probably the best option for the farmer there. And again, to, there has never ever been a soybean that naturally had all those resistances in it. They all had to be grouped together. And the same applies then to uh, most of our modern major crops then have incorporate traits from many parents. Here's an example of a really well-known high quality uh, rice variety. And the boxes in yellow are the different parents that gave it the desirable qualities it has today. And notice this one rice variety has the best qualities from 20 different varieties that were all lumped together in one package. So conventional breeding then uh, starts with those crosses. We make those crosses and uh, in any given year we'll make a few thousand crosses and then we get the, the seed from those crosses and kind of blow up the population size because one plant gives you many seeds. And then as you advance the generations, you select for traits you want. You know, we want to make sure it's resistant to the disease, that uh, it looks like a soybean, it has the right maturity, the right quality, that it yields well. And uh, the numbers then that survive from one generation to another are fewer and fewer until, you know, because along the way, if it doesn't uh, live up to what it needs, we, we, we eliminate it until we finally, after say some 10 years or so, we have one new uh, variety. Now, sometimes the trait that we need is not in, in the crop or in the wild relatives of the crop. So we use other approaches. One of them is mutagenesis. We can either mutate with chemicals or with uh, radiation. Uh, for, you know, Oak Ridge Lab used to have a big program and here's an ad from 1961 selling irradiated seeds. And you know, they point out that uh, the results are completely unpredictable. True, but that was considered desirable. Um, and you know, there it's uh, completely unlike anything else. And that's what we're looking for: is new, new the traits that we're lacking. And for uh, $3.95, you were able to buy eight seeds. And if you adjust that for inflation, it's about $30 in today's money. So people were willing to pay good money for that. Here's another picture uh, of a mutation breeding field. At the center of that photograph, you have your source of radiation. And different crops are uh, planted in circles around it so that they can be mutated. According to the uh, database for FAO and the International Atomic Energy Commission, there are 20, there's over 2,500 registered varieties that were developed from this process. Well, what are some things that you might know that came from this process? Well, pretty much all pasta wheat has gone through that. Some of the orange uh, or the pink grapefruits uh, have came from that, and a, a lot of the bush beans that we use in the uh, U.S. Uh, came out of mutation breeding. So, you know, it's everyday um, foods. Then, 
if, if, if that failed, sometimes the trait you needed was in a very distantly related species that you really could not cross very well. So as far back as the 1950s, they were trying to find ways to transfer those genes in. And here's a famous example where it was a gene called L9. It gave resistance to a disease called rust. And it was in that little grassy thing uh, that you see in that picture. And the idea was how to move it into the grass. And you could, the two were not cross compatible. You could not just cross them. But it turns out that the grass would cross with another relative of wheat. So that cross was made. Then one took the uh, result from that cross, and you could cross it repetitively back to wheat. And after several crosses, you got what you see here. You see the big bracket uh, shows all the, the chromosomes that wheat has, and in the circle in red, you have that one chromosome that came from that wild grass. And somewhere in that chromosome, there's probably, I don't know, five, 7,000 genes on it, but one of those is the gene we want. And in that era, you know, how do you move it? And they didn't have good ways to do it, so it was simple. You go back to x-rays. The x-rays breaks up the grass chromosome into little pieces, and the little pieces kind of jump into the wheat chromosomes, and the uh, final product is uh, wheat resistant to that trait, and then it gets used as a parent for other breeding programs. So some things to notice about this is that we moved many genes. To this day, we really don't know what got moved, but there have not been any safety issues or regulations associated with the process. And I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit to what I'm going to talk about towards the end of my talk, but today we actually have the technology. We can find that one gene that we want for the disease resistance, and we can move that one gene by itself. However, if we do that, we have many regulations, many safety studies that are required, and last year the cost of doing this had been uh, estimated to be uh, $34 million, U.S. dollars. But uh, the example I gave you was with wheat. Uh, according to a literature review that we did, we have on record 111 genes introduced into uh, our modern crops with this technology. Uh, these include 55 into tomato, 12 each into rice and potato, and several dozen then into wheat. So uh, all this, again, is part of our food supply, and there have been no safety issues with them. In fact, uh, for one of the ILSI studies, we did a big literature review and of the millions of traditional varieties that are on record, we only found nine reports of unintended effects that were harmful. And the extent of the harm cost was a couple of cases of skin rash and some stomach aches. We have never caused more serious damage than that. So nine cases out of several million makes this one of our safest uh, technologies around. But the interesting thing is that all of these involved known toxins in those crops that had become elevated during the breeding process. So because of those experiences today, if we, there are known toxins in a crop, it is uh, customary to evaluate any new varieties for those known toxins to make sure we have not increased them uh, beyond where we were supposed to. But what about unknown toxins? Funny thing is we could not find a single report. We could not find any reports where something that was not known to exist in the genus appeared spontaneously. I do have to add a footnote to that. Uh, some of the EFSA documents, and even, I think one of the FDA documents, does refer to one example that came up with a toxin not known to be in that species. And, it's, uh, and that was a report based in 1996. However, had they done a good literature review, that toxin had been reported in that species uh, in 1981. So I get back to my pre uh, original premise. We have not found any verifiable reports of a novel, unknown, previously unknown toxin arising from the uh, breeding process. 
But the result of all this in the U.S. has been improved yield. You know, if you combine it with our improved agricultural management, it's like soybean yield has increased five times in the past uh, uh, 85 years, which is just amazing. And in the case of corn, the increases have been even greater. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the USDA released a report last year that uh, just in the past tw uh, 30 years, agricultural production in the U.S. increased 50% on less land. So it is a very important source of uh, food security uh, for, for us. So this gets us uh, to the era of uh, genetic engineering. And this is a cartoon that I frequently use to introduce the topic because I find it symbolic of many things. It's a new and powerful technology. It allows us to work on traits that uh, we could not work on before. Uh, it's a technology that lends itself a lot to exaggeration. You know, no matter how powerful it is, we still cannot create giant fruits and vegetables like the ones you see there. And if there's anyone in the crowd that is convinced that this technology is dangerous, there is your proof, and the very first victim of the technology was Bugs Bunny. So, as I mentioned, this is something we used when all the traditional methods fail. In this example, uh, papaya ring spot virus. These are some trees in Mexico, and the reason they look so bad is because they're infected with papaya ring spot virus, and we haven't found any resistance to it that is effective around the world. And uh, it, it's actually an epi worldwide epidemic. So here's another picture of trees infected with the virus. These happen to be in Thailand. But in a laboratory like mine, we can actually um, get cells from one of those plants. To those cells, we add the DNA that's going to make it resistant uh, to the virus, and this DNA can come from pretty much anywhere. And once the cell has uptaken the DNA, uh, we get we coax the cells back. We change the hormone levels and the growth medium, and we can actually get little plants back. And in the end, we have our new papayas. And the only difference that here between the papayas and the two photos is one gene for virus resistance. So what is genetic modification? In the agri you know, from an agricultural point of view, it's going from that little tomato to that big tomato. In the modern sense, uh, in the media, uh, social networks and all that, it means genetic engineering. Uh, other terms used would be biotechnology, uh, transgenic, which is probably the most correct one, or the one that has become the most common, which is a GMO for genetically modified organism. Around the world, though, we do have, um, so all of this is biotechnology. That's which, you know, the difference between biotech and uh, genetic engineering, uh, very broad, uh, field that includes agriculture, medicine, food science, and whatnot. Within biotechnology, we have genetic modification, and within genetic modification, we have our GMOs. To make these is a very similar process to what I showed you for conventional uh, modification. Instead of crossing two plants at the top, we go through a process of gene insertion in the laboratory, and, this is, and you do thousands of these. And then as you advance the generations, you again select along the way for all the traits uh, that you need to be doing uh, for them, and at the end, you're going to end up with one event, we call them an event, that is going to move forward, that you're going to cross with your regular varieties uh, to deploy and take through regulatory testing. As with conventional breeding, along the way, we eliminate anything that's not wanted. And you know, this plays an important role then in ensuring that things are going to be stable and behave as predicted once it finally makes it to a uh, farmer's field. There's a universal criterion for anything that does make it to a farmer's field. 
And that universal criterion is that uh, anything produced from genetic engineering has got to be at least as safe as their conventional counterparts. And to do that, uh, there is a big infrastructure in place that uh, the next speaker is going to talk about. But the one thing to remember is that we're in a global market. And many of the importing countries also want to uh, make sure that the food they're importing meet this uh, safety criterion. So what happens then is we have the event that we hope to commercialize, or somebody hopes to commercialize. Uh, whatever countries want to analyze its safety are going to do so, and this is just a partial list of them. And it's not till pretty much all of them have uh, looked at that and agreed that it's uh, safe for human consumption and feed use that the product can enter the world market. And, th and it's the data for this process then that gives you the $34 million uh, in costs that I mentioned earlier. Just as uh, with uh, GM agri uh, crops, GM microbes are very common. Uh, a lot of common food ingredients uh, are, uh, th are the result or obtained via genetically modified uh, microbes. Uh, a lot of fermented beverages are made with genetically modified microbes, but unlike crops, these are seldom considered controversial or labeled or anything else. They're kind of out of sight, out of mind. It's when we get to crops that the controversies begin. So if we take a snapshot of these crops last year, uh, last year they were planted in about, in, in over uh, 16 million uh, hectares, um, sorry, last year they were planted by over 16 million farmers in 21 country, 31 countries. These 31 countries were the ones where the planting was legal. I think the real numbers are probably somewhere closer to 50, 60 countries uh, because the, you know, uh, farmers like to borrow them uh, from each other and take them across borders. If you look at the past 17 years uh, since we started keeping uh, count, the use of uh, GM uh, crops has increased continuously every year, and last year reached uh, about half a billion acres. Now, if you were to add the land that was planted to GMOs over the past 17 years, it equals the land area of the United States and Mexico combined. Why is this important? It is significant because that means that we have so much data about these things that any questions that arise, we just go back to our data and we don't have to be making assumptions or jumping to conclusions. Also, I w uh, in order to give you a perspective or a, a yardstick of how fast uh, this growth is in uh, GM crops, this is the growth line for another sector of the agricultural industry that's growing very rapidly, and that's the organic industry. And even as fast as it's growing, it still stays behind uh, relative to GM crops. So what are some of the crops uh, that uh, might be out there right now? Well, here's just some pictures. For example, uh, here's an herbicide tolerant uh, rice, I believe. And here's two plots. In the one plot, the rice is lost within the weeds. In the other plot, uh, herbicide sprayed over the top killed the weeds, but not the crop. Here's an example of virus-resistant squash. Uh, the front row is really nice, pretty, big, healthy plants. The back row are uh, kind of uh, sick-looking plants, and that's because they're infected with virus. And you, again, you can see the um, impact of the genetic engineering there. Uh, here, Hawaiian papayas, one of the first engineered crops. Again, it's the papaya ring spot virus I mentioned earlier. And this technology is credited then with saving the uh, papaya industry in Hawaii. That was her number one agricultural uh, export. And then uh, some, they call this the blue rose. They didn't ask me for my opinion on the color blue. But my understanding is that in Japan, they, have, they can sell these for 20 to $30 a rose. So it is a, a, a nice, profitable crop. 
Oh, this is something that Embrapa uh, came up with. Uh, it's uh, their bean. It's a very important staple crop in Brazil. Also suffers from viral problems. And you can see the engineered version and the non-engineered version. Time of harvest, you can see what farmers have to deal with now versus the type of uh, crop they can get uh, with the engineered plants. Herbicide tolerance, uh, two plots of corn in one, uh, there's a lot of weeds that somebody would have to get in there with a plow to take out. The other one, they went in with a backpack sprayer, controlled the weeds, and there's all the dead weeds are like a protective blanket on the soil. Insect resistance, uh, just look at the uh, damage of, the insect damage that's on the leaves on the one side, whereas the leaves on the other side are quite nice and clean. More important, perhaps from a human health point, is this, the corn earworm. How many of you have ever had a corn earworm in your can or frozen bag? Just one person? Yeah. Uh, in other countries, though, where we, they don't eat the corn fresh but dry it out, the uh, wounds that this uh, caterpillar is making are going to become infected with a fungus. And in many of the, the particularly in Latin America, the peasants there, uh, that's the only thing they have to eat. And it does contribute a lot to their uh, local health uh, problems. So here you have the engineered ear versus what has been a standard in parts of Central America. Rootworm resistant corn. Here's another product. Uh, the middle root is, it has been protected from uh, rootworms uh, by engineering, or you can pr historically protect them with insecticides. And if you don't protect them, you see the damage that the insects uh, will do. Roots are important at the time uh, to help plants uh, cope with stress and other things. So here's an ex a picture, I think, out of Indiana. It stopped raining for a little bit, and that little period of drought stress, you can really tell the uh, impact of the root system on the quality of the plant and the subsequent yield. Another case with insect resistance, uh, these are photos taken near where I live. Uh, I come from Georgia, land of cotton. This is a cotton square, and you can see the damage the bollworm is doing versus an uh, engineered square. And then at the field level, I, I, you know, you guys can figure out which is the engineered half, and it's also self-evident why farmers just have, uh, like this trait uh, so much. Another pro uh, uh, product about to come on the market, oil quality. On the top, we have uh, olive oil, which everyone touts as being one of the healthiest oils around. It's uh, very high in oleic acid. On the bottom is a normal composition for soybean oil, ha has a lot of uh, linoleic oil. And then the new uh, so uh, soybean oil is coming out uh, in the middle. It's got a profile almost identical to that of olive oil, but at the price of a soybean oil. And the, what was in the news last year uh, of the drought, and uh, again, here's a, a, a photo of what the new technologies can do to help mitigate some of the effects of drought. So that's sort of what we talk about then when we're talking about engineered crops. But it ultimately gets back to this question. Is engineering safe? And I've got a quote for you. Uh, we have recently advanced our knowledge of genetics to the point where we can manipulate things in a way never intended by nature. We must proceed with utmost caution. Anyone guess who might have made this quote? Who might have said this? Somebody, I think everyone in this room knows. What's that? It was Luther Burbank, 1906. Uh, so the, the point of the matter here is that throughout history, genetic manipulation ha uh, tends to get looked at with a lot of caution. And I think this caution is pr uh, then uh, gets translated into a lot of different uh, safety studies and regulations and precautions that are always in place. And uh, so there's this infrastructure in place now to look at the safety of uh, engineered crops. 
and uh, Dr. Andrew Bartholomeos is going to describe most of these to you. I'm just going to talk about one of these. One of the concerns was, you know, we're adding a transgene, we're inserting a piece of DNA into the existing DNA. And a lot of the safety testing we do comes out of the concern of what happens if you insert DNA into DNA. Well, it turns out that we're at a point now where we can start addressing these questions directly. And we do that by comparing what happens at the DNA level with uh, traditional breathing, which, as I mentioned, is just incredible amounts of uh, changes it can make. Uh, and we compare those changes with the um, uh, ones that happen during engineering. More often than not, you really cannot change the way something looks if you don't also change the DNA uh, of the crop. And we have the tools to do it. All the spin-off technology that came out of the Human Genome Project gives us the tools to start looking at changes during conventional breeding. And the one change I want to look at for you guys is simply the insertion of DNA. For example, again, here's another picture showing all the variability in tomato. I want to talk about the elongated tomatoes, the one that the arrow is pointing to. This one uh, appeared uh, in, during historic times, at, uh, last couple hundred years or sooner, and we think it was, it's something that happened in Spain. Well, what gives us a long tomato? Well, if you look at the DNA level, uh, here's just a, a part of uh, uh, chromosome 10 of tomato. It's, it's 25,000 base pairs of uh, chromosome 10 of tomato that were copied, and then the copy was inserted, insert of DNA, into chromosome 7, and it was inserted inside another gene that changed its function, and the result is a long tomato, but it's still a safe tomato. And it turns out that such DNA insertions are pretty common during the breeding process. Um, one of the things that all plants have are the so-called jumping genes. Um, the jumping genes are DNA sections that kind of move around uh, the genome. Uh, they even exist in us uh, humans. And the, some, of the pheno, some of the changes, the morphological changes that they might give you, uh, how, you know, the, the, like the st uh, striped flower petals that I think everyone has seen, are a, a perfect example of uh, jumping genes. And, you know, corn is also another one that's easy to see. So the red circle and the white arrow are pointing to uh, changes you'd see in corn due to jumping genes. Indian corn you know, would be, an, uh, is you know, a lot of that look comes from jumping genes. So this is, again, looking at uh, corn. The, the straight line with the yellow boxes is a little piece of a chromosome of corn. And the triangles on top of it are jumping genes that jump into those sections of corn. And that is in one corn variety. If you look at another corn variety, it's the same segment of chromosome, but if you look at the triangles, it's a different set of jumping genes that uh, jumped into them. So again, uh, corn has more of these jumping genes than it has regular genes in it. And it's probably true for a lot of crops. Here's another uh, example. It's a paper that just came out. What you're looking at is a family tree for different soybean varieties. The uh, oldest, you know, the, the great, great, great grandparents are um, in the blue, and then the, the, in the red you have some of the more modern uh, soybean varieties that have been, uh, have come from it. But then if you just look at those uh, kind of purple-violet numbers that jump out from you in the middle, those are jumping genes found in that variety and only in that one variety. So you can see that if you were to go out there and take any soybean variety at random, you know, it might have a thousand insertions that are only found in it, or it might have a couple hundred insertions that are only found in it. In this sample of 31 soybean varieties, there are over 25,000 insertions that, have, uh, that are only found once. So, and again, with the GMOs, we worry about one insertion, 
And in nature, then, we have hundreds and thousands of these. How, how fast does all this happen? It's a really cool experiment. They went to a rice plant, took two, two grains of rice, and then planted them and kept planting them for 20 generations. At the end of 20 generations, they looked at the jumping genes of one particular family of jumping genes, and the resulting plants only had 23 jumping genes that were in their original location. There were over 200 in one line that had moved and over 400. So not only had they moved, they had increased in number. So it's a very fast uh, process. And yet, you know, again, rice remains one of the safest plants we can possibly have. So I'm just getting at that there's a lot more similarity uh, between what the GMO, the engineering process does, and what the traditional breeding process does. And one has been safe, you can sort of ex start extrapolating that those uh, safety standards or criteria apply to the, to the GMOs. So, you know, breeding depends on changes at the DNA level. Uh, these modifications have pretty much been harmless. Uh, they haven't given us unknown hazards. They've um, in, maybe changed known hazards. And the changes brought about by the in, uh, transgenics are very similar to what goes on in uh, natural changes. So there's a couple of books that I love to give my students. One of them is Just Food. And uh, it's a really, uh, I, you can get it on Amazon. It's very, very inexpensive. It's a very easy read. It was written by an agricultural uh, historian. And, uh, and as I say, it's some, you can probably read it in an afternoon or an evening. But it, it puts a lot of the changes in agriculture in perspective. A lot of the buzzwords that we hear today, you know, local food, organic, GMOs, and everything, he does one of the best jobs of putting them in perspective. For other people who, like me, are fascinated by plant breeding and changes, there's this book called Hybrid. Again, it's written for the layperson. You don't have to be a geneticist to be able to read it. It's a very accurate history of how we've modified crops the past uh, 500 years and all the social concerns that have historically uh, revolved around those. And I, again, I highly, highly uh, recommend that. It has a lot of neat anecdotes, like where did the red delicious apple come from and the golden delicious and so forth. So with that, I'm going to leave you with my final parting thought. Uh, uh, Peter Sandman, uh, very well known in risk analysis. The risks that hurt people and the risks that upset people are uh, completely unconnected. And when you're talking about food, it's very emotional and we tend to uh, focus on it and ignore other things. So with that, uh, thank you so much for your attention.